Well, welcome to Grace Point Fellowship. That was a clip from The Passion of the Christ. Uh, if you're looking for something to watch, uh, great, great movie. Uh, it's a little uh, graphic and, uh, and it can be a little bit disturbing for young kids, but it is a great uh, look at the death and resurrection of Jesus. I recommend it. I love that uh, first scene that shows the heart of God as, as Jesus was dying and we see uh, the view from above and the raindrop symbolizing a, a tear from God. And uh, of course, is uh, much. it seems like a tragedy, uh, a movie about sorrow. Uh, the ending is just so beautiful as we see the stone rolled away from the tomb and uh, Jesus uh, resurrected. Uh, I just love that. So welcome uh, to our Easter celebration. He is risen. Nobody here to say he is risen indeed. Uh, it's kind of one of the terrible things about not being able to worship together. Uh, even my kids are downstairs. My wife is upstairs right now. So I don't even have them to say he is risen indeed. But uh, we'll say it to each other later. But our Savior is risen. And it's so good that at least we can meet together uh, via the internet, via um, YouTube uh, to worship together. So I just invite you to worship together uh, as we think about as we contemplate as we look to the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Uh, let's begin this service uh, in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your great love for us, your great love that was shown in the fact that you sent your Son. For you love the world so much that you gave your one and only Son, that whosoever believes in him would not perish but have eternal life. Thank you, Jesus, that you willingly gave up your life for us whom you love. You call us your friends. You call us your brothers and sisters. We thank you so much for that. And we thank you so much that because you rose again, Jesus, that you conquered death, you conquered sin, and you proved your words to be true, and we proved that we can trust in your promises. Because you rose again, we can trust your promise that we too will rise from the dead. Thank you so much for all who believed, who all have received you. You have given the right to become children of God, and we too will rise again, even though we die. Thank you for this time, God. I just pray your blessing on this service. Speak to us, I pray. Accept our praise and worship as well as we remember your great love for us. Amen. Let's join together right now in worship. Well, welcome everyone. We're so glad uh, that we could join with you this morning to uh, spend this time in worship and praise. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. And so I do invite you to stand. Uh, we love you, church family, and we're glad that we could come and rejoice together. He is a risen King. Let's arise and sing this morning. There is a King. You're risen King. Radiant, he reigns in majesty, he conquered death, it has no stain, yet that is worth.
find strength to face the day. It's in your presence, all our fears are washed away. Wash away. a great God. How great is our God. The splendor of the King. Clothed in majesty, let all the earth rejoice, and all the earth rejoice. Sing with me. He wraps himself in light And darkness tries to hide And trembles at his voice Trembles at his voice How great is our God Sing with me How great is our God God, cause all will see how great, how great is our God. H to H, H to H, He stands. Son, the lion and the 
our God. Last time, how great is our God? How great is our God? Sing with me, how great is our God? Because all will see how great, how great is our God. Amen. Praise God. Let's take some time now to pray together for our church, for our families, uh, for the world on this Easter. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, first of all, we want to pray right now that in this situation that the world finds itself in, with the coronavirus, with isolation, God, we want to pray and ask you to intercede. God, many of us know people who are sick. We pray right now for them. We ask you, God, to just bring healing into their lives. We, God, we pray for all the doctors and nurses, the healthcare workers, that you give them wisdom, you give them strength, you keep them safe. And we just pray, God, for the scientists that are looking for a cure for the coronavirus, a vaccine, that you'll give them wisdom. We just pray, God, that you will work and that you will provide a miracle, God, that this will end maybe sooner than people expect. Even more, though, God, above and beyond that, we pray that you will touch people's lives. God, that this whole thing will remind us that we are not in control, that you are in control, God. We need you. All people need you. And so, God, I pray that you will draw people to yourself through this coronavirus uh, outbreak. I pray that, God, people will be drawn back to you, recognizing that, God, they need a Savior. That, God, this world will continue to be a mess without your touch, without your healing. God, we pray for our families, that you keep us close. Uh, we pray that you keep us safe. We pray that you draw, again, us to yourself. That we will remember to keep you included uh, in our lives, in our worship, in our activities, even as we face isolation. Lord, I pray for our church that you will help us to stay close to each other, that we will connect, that we will uh, reach out to those who are lonely, that we will reach out to those who are in need. Help us to be the church that you want us to be, that we will uh, go, we will not be afraid, but we will act out of love to help those that are, who are in need. Thank you, God, that you loved us first, that you gave your life for us while we were still sinners that we could have peace with you. God, I pray that you will help us to understand the resurrection, what it means for the world, what it means for each of us as individuals. Teach us, I pray this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Join me now for this morning's scripture reading from Luke chapter 24. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they had entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground, but the men said to them, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here, he is risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee? The Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. Then they remembered his words. When they came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the others. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the others with them who told this to the apostles. But they did not believe the women because their words seemed to them like nonsense. Peter, however, got up and ran to the tomb. Bending over, he saw the strips of linen lying by themselves, and he went away, wondering to himself what had happened on the road to Emmaus. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. 
but they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, asked, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened these last days? What things, he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed, before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it's the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see Jesus. He said to them, How foolish you are, and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached a village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he were going further. But they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking with us on the road, and opened the scriptures to us? They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven, and those with them assembled together and saying, It's true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened on the way, and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. Jesus then appears to the disciples. While they were still talking about this, Jesus stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. He said to them, Why are you troubled? Why do you your, why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I, myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones, as you see I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they still did not believe it, because of joy and amazement, he asked them, Do you have anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. He said to them, this is what I told you while I was with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, this is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead in the third day. And repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all the nations beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. I am going to send you what my Father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. When he, led, when he had led them out to the vicinity of Bethany, he lifted up his hands and blessed them. While he was blessing them, he left them and was taken up into heaven. Then they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And they stayed continually at the temple, praising God. I love this passage so much. Uh, like a surprise happy ending to what seemed to be a terrible tragedy. From the tomb to the road to Emmaus to Jesus appearing to the disciples, we see the beginning of a world that was changing because Jesus had been resurrected from the dead. What an amazing message. And that message is simply this. The resurrection is an amazing, earth-shattering, shocking, cataclysmic, wonderful, monumental, paradigm-transforming historical event. There's a mouthful, eh? It changed absolutely everything. I grew up in the church, believing what I heard, and so I thought that the resurrection was simply a historical event. It wasn't until Bible college that I really started hearing other non-historical accounts of the resurrection. 
Some non-believing friends, atheists, and even some Christian sources had different takes on the resurrection story. The non-believing was pretty straightforward. The story of the resurrection to them was simply a myth, a legend, or a story. The logic, though usually not very well thought out, was basically something like this. Christianity, Christians say that Jesus rose from the dead. People don't rise from the dead, therefore Jesus didn't rise from the dead. Uh, I want you to watch this short little video to explain uh, the argument. Watch this from my Lutheran friends. Okay, Patrick, tell us a bit more about this atheism thing. Yeah, Patrick, tell us. Certainly, yes. Well, you see, in, in ancient times, people like you invented stories about various gods creating the earth and mankind because you lacked the scientific knowledge necessary to understand the origins of the universe. But in my day, thanks to scientific progress, we do understand these things, and so it's no longer necessary for us to fool ourselves into thinking that some silly... God created us. But what about all that stuff that defies scientific explanation? Isn't that evidence of God's existence? Yeah, riddle us that, Patrick. Stuff like what? Well, how about the multitude of miracles in the Bible, chief among them the resurrection of our Lord Jesus? Oh, you sweet little simpletons, people don't rise from the dead. Except for that one time Jesus rose from the dead. Yeah, that was awesome. No, what I'm saying is that Jesus never rose from the dead. And how do you know that, Patrick? Because it's not possible for people to rise from the dead. Yeah, we know. That's why it was sort of a big deal when Jesus rose from the dead. Look, I think you're far too uneducated to understand this, but if people could rise from the dead, then people would rise from the dead. If Jesus could rise from the dead, surely someone else would have risen from the dead as well. Other people have risen from the dead. Like who? Like all the people in the Bible who rose from the dead because Jesus rose them from the dead not long before he himself rose from the dead. Well, obviously you can't count those examples. Why not, Patrick? Because they come from the Bible, and the Bible is a ridiculous book full of silly stories that couldn't possibly happen, like... People rising from the dead? Exactly. Right. So according to you, the resurrection doesn't prove the existence of God because it never happened. And we know it never happened because we know that people can't rise from the dead. And we know that people can't rise from the dead because no one ever has risen from the dead if you don't count all the people who have risen from the dead. I think I'm onto your little trick here, Patrick. Yeah, you're a sneaky little secularist, Patrick. So your strategy for proving the non-existence of God is to systematically rule out every piece of evidence for the existence of God solely because that evidence could be used to prove the existence of God. What a perfectly reasonable use of the scientific method, Patrick. Yeah, we'd love to see you employ this strategy in the laboratory, Patrick. Hey, Connell, I just proved that there's no such thing as barium. And how'd you do that, Donald? By throwing out all the samples of barium. I'm surprised more defense attorneys don't attempt this in the courtroom. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, I have conclusively proven to you that my client is innocent, as long as you ignore the murder weapon, his confession, and the 400 witnesses who saw him stab that guy in the face. Look, clearly you're not enlightened enough to understand what I, I mean really, Patrick. By your logic, the first president of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod could prove himself to be the best looking man in the world. All he'd have to do is lock every other male on the planet in his dressing room right before the beauty pageant begins. Oh, no, even then I would still lose. So I may not be a scientist, Patrick. I may not possess your superior intellect and education. I may even be a superstitious Neanderthal who thinks that thunder is what happens when God yells at leprechauns. I think it's the result of a shockwave in the air due to the sudden thermal expansion of plasma in the lightning channel, but that's because I'm stupid. Nonetheless, I still know a lame argument when I hear one. And when you accuse Christians of remaining in ignorance because they refuse to allow any evidence to challenge their theistic worldview, only to dismiss every eyewitness account of our Lord's resurrection solely because it challenges your atheistic worldview, well, that's not just lame. It's also a wee bit of the clover calling the grass green. That's an adorable Celtic twist on a classic idiom, Patrick. Don't be absurd. I treat the Bible exactly the way I treat everything else. I'm a man of reason and evidence and facts. I'm a man of science, a world-renowned evolutionary biologist. I defy you to give me one example of something that I believe in despite no scientist ever having seen it happen. Evolution. Dang it. <laughs> But really, have you actually read your holy book? Your god is a heartless, hateful, murderous ogre. There's no reason to believe in such a vile deity.
I'm sorry, Patrick. I'm gonna need a second to recover from that. Yeah, Patrick, stop in the name of logic before you break my brain. Placing your failure to properly understand the justice of the Almighty aside for a moment, did you honestly just argue that God doesn't exist because he's mean? Why, if being a jerk made you cease to exist, then every war in human history would have been over the second it started. Rosie O'Donnell would have disappeared in a puff of smoke in 1998 instead of getting fired from The View once every seven minutes. And that jerk who makes those Lutheran satire videos wouldn't even be able to finish recording. Well, I hope you enjoyed that little video for my Lutheran friends. Uh, so that was the atheistic point of view. And, and you, can, you can understand atheists coming up with some kind of rationale, though it wasn't very logical. But that is basically the logic with most, most atheists on the story of the resurrection. Resurrections can't happen, therefore Jesus did not rise from the dead. Still, more perplexing were the so-called Christian friends and other Christian sources that explained the resurrection of Jesus with some metaphysical, sentimental, allegorical hoopla. They claimed that the message of the resurrection of Jesus, get this, was not that Jesus rose from the dead. You got that? They claim the message of the resurrection was not that Jesus rose from the dead. Okay, this takes some explaining. After Jesus' death, the disciples experienced his presence. They felt powerfully that he was with them still, somehow, in spirit. Peter, for example, experienced the forgiveness of Jesus, that Jesus had really forgiven him for his failures and denials. And as time went on, as the disciples died out, the followers of the disciples began to find ways of expressing these higher truths, these spiritual experiences. And so they expressed them by writing the Gospels. So the higher truth that Peter experienced forgiveness from Jesus turned into John chapter 21, which is a story of Peter meeting Jesus by a fire and receiving Jesus' forgiveness. As Jesus asked him three times, do you love me, Peter? The stories of the resurrections themselves, though they seem literalistic, were simply symbolic representations. I don't even know what to say about this. I can best uh, demonstrate what I really think about this explanation by hitting my head really hard. It just doesn't make sense. Uh, John Dominic Crossan, a former Catholic priest, put it like this. The Emmaus Road experience with Jesus never really happened. And it always happens. So that's the view. Emmaus never happened. It didn't really happen. These are legends. And yet Emmaus always happens because the higher truths are forgiveness and hope. The thing is, if you read Luke chapter 24, even at the simplest first impression level, it just doesn't make sense at all. Jesus appears among them and he says, look at my hands. And my feet, it is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones. Jesus says, do you have something to eat? Give me something to eat. And so they gave him a piece of broiled fish and he took it and ate it. Isn't it wonderful how a higher truth is being symbolically represented there? Jesus eating fish and chips with the disciples. What is the higher truth being symbolic, symbolically represented there? The message of the text is exactly the opposite of what John Dominic Croissant and the others like him were claiming. Jesus is saying, hello, hello, it's not just a symbol. I'm really here. I am not just an impression in your mind. I am not just a kind of spiritual presence. I'm here in the flesh and bones. Feel me. Give me something to eat. But it's so not symbolic. It makes no sense that way. Why is this account here? Because it happened. The whole chapter has the earmarks of an eyewitness account. So let's look at several ways that this passage shows that it is a reliable eyewitness account and not a made-up symbolic telling of some spiritual truth. First, let's look to verses 1 to 12. The initial witnesses to the empty tomb were who? Women. Today, that doesn't seem like such a big deal. But women in that day, in that time, in that culture, had a very low status. To put it bluntly, back in that culture, both Roman and Jewish, women were considered little more than possessions. Seriously, not much different from livestock. 
the words of women were not considered reliable. They were not allowed to testify in court. Their testimony, testimony carried no weight. And unless we understand the culture of that day, we don't really see how strange it is that women are said to be the first eyewitnesses. If you're making up a story, if you're making up some legend about the resurrection of Jesus, you would never, never put women there as the first eyewitnesses because everybody in that culture believed that women were unreliable witnesses. It would undermine the plausibility of the account with any of the hearers or readers of that time. And therefore, the only reason that Luke could have possibly put women in as the first eyewitnesses is because they were there. There was no other motivation that he would have had to put them there. The biblical narratives of the resurrection, including Luke 24, have all the same marks, not of a vision, not of religious literature, not of myths, but of eyewitness accounts. But you can see that these accounts are, from the limited point of view, of eyewitnesses, people on the inside. Names are named. And what are these names for? Uh, Cleopas. What are the names of the women? Joanna and Mary, the mother of James. Why are they so carefully listed? It was their way of saying that if you want to check out what I'm telling you, go back and talk to the sources, the eyewitnesses. But then we get to maybe the most amazing thing that's found in verse 52, and it says this, and then they worshipped him. But the Jewish people are the last people on the face of the earth to be open to the idea that a human being could be God. And yet in the early church, something changed. We know almost immediately from sources both secular and biblical that they were worshipping Jesus early first century. Jesus, if he was thought to be only a man, how could he be worshipped by Jewish people? And there's only one explanation. Something must have happened. Something must have shattered their paradigm. And you know what that was? It was a historical event. They saw him, the resurrected Jesus, the Son of God. So here's the point. The resurrection was not preached in the early church as a symbolic representation of wonder, wonderful higher spiritual truths like, oh, we must always keep hope. That's honestly quite ridiculous. The resurrection was preached as a hard, bare, sometimes terribly irritating, paradigm shattering, inconvenient, but impossible to dismiss fact. Fact. You know what a fact is, right? There's a fact. We might not like it. I wish it wasn't there, but it's there. What am I going to do it? Do about it? Well, there's nothing I can do because it's a fact. It's a fact. It's not really the way of our culture in it. Our culture uh, these days is about likes and this and dislikes. Facebook is the perfect example. Oh, I like this. Oh, I don't like this. Oh, I like what he posted. I don't like what she posted. Paul himself was at first very offended by Christianity, offended by the gospel. He was offended by the idea that what? No more temple. You don't need a temple. You don't need sacrifices for sin. It's outrageous. He was a Pharisee who was offended by the very idea of Christianity. He liked tradition. He liked the old system. And he didn't like Christianity. It offended him. Remember, so much so that he attacked, he persecuted. He had Christians arrested and put to death. But then he encountered the risen Jesus. Then he knew it was a fact. And he couldn't deny it. And then it didn't matter anymore about likes or dislikes. And he worshipped him. Over the years, I've had so many uh, friends, acquaintances, people that have said something like, I could never be a Christian. And I ask, well, why? There are so many parts of the Bible that are so offensive. And some people are offended by what the Bible says about money. Uh, Some people are offended by the wrath of God. Some people are offended. Uh, by other things. Uh, Today, probably the biggest thing is sex and marriage. But let me ask you a question. Are you saying that because there are parts of the Bible that you don't really like, that Jesus could not have been raised from the dead? And they answered, as you might, as I might, well, no, I guess I can't make that leap. Just because we don't like some of the things that the Bible says, that has nothing to do with whether or not the resurrection 
really happened. And this is the way it is. Every part of the Bible is important. To all believers, we understand that. But let's put aside the ethical teaching of the Bible for a minute. And here's the point. If Jesus was raised from the dead, we're going to have to deal with everything else in the Bible. If Jesus wasn't raised from the dead, I don't know why we're worried about other things like that. Back to the beginning. The resurrection is an earth-shattering, shocking, cataclysmic, wonderful, monumental, paradigm-transforming, historical event. It changed everything. All history in the world changed after that. The question is, has it changed you? Has it changed me? Have you even looked at the evidence? Not considering whether or not you like or dislike something in, you know, about Jesus' teaching or the biblical teaching. But if you first considered the resurrection and what it means, if it really happened, it's the most important thing you could ever believe. And I've barely scratched the surface here on all the evidence. There's all sorts of non-biblical historical documents. Uh, there's Roman and Jewish documents that talk about the fact that Jesus actually was crucified and that his, his followers claimed that he literally rose from the dead. There's the Roman soldiers who were guarding the tomb. There is the fact that a one and a half ton stone was blocking the entrance. There were over 500 witnesses. And then there's the changed lives of the disciples who ran away when Jesus was arrested. But after the resurrection, they were willing to die for the gospel, the good news that Jesus lives again. And then there's the existence of the church that has worshipped and proclaimed the resurrected Jesus from the earliest documents in the first century, just years after Jesus actually rose from the dead. I challenge all of us to consider the truth of the resurrection. Evidence, history, changed lives point to simply one fact, that Jesus really did rise from the dead. Given credence to the truth of his words, his identity as Savior, as King, and the Son of God. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. People, everything starts and ends in the Christian faith with, with the resurrection. The evidence for it is overwhelming. If you've never looked into it, I really pray and I ask you to do that. Talk to me if you want to look at some more documents and other evidence for the resurrection. But it's true. And if it is true, what does it mean? It means that all our other hang-ups about the gospel, we got to set them aside. we got to trust Jesus, take him at his word, because he rose again. And whoever believes in him will have everlasting life. Amen. Imagine 
Living for all 
Well, thank you so much for being with us. Let's just leave with God's blessing now. Let's pray together. And now may the God... Nope, redo. Thank you so much for being with us today. Let's close in a word of prayer. And now, God, may the glory and promise of Easter bring peace and happiness to each of our families. May Christ, our risen Savior, continue to bless us abundantly and to be our loving guide. And may the truth of Jesus' resurrection rest in our hearts, giving us hope, hope for our own lives, for our future, and for the future of the entire world. Amen. Thanks so much for being with us today. I hope to see you all real soon. God bless.